Thank you, Max, and good morning. And since it is early in the morning, you probably are half in an altered state, so this should be easy to swallow. Okay, uh, so that is the title and that's the outline of the presentation. I will first define what I mean by anomalous experience. There is nothing sacred about the definition, but it's just how we use it. Then uh, very briefly, of course, many people already yesterday talk about how ordinary states of consciousness end up misrepresenting whatever may be there, but I will just bring a bit of neurology. As Jim was saying a few minutes ago, in today's presentation you probably won't hear much of Sanskrit. You may hear about <laughs> other topics, but not much of the Pali Canon or anything of that. Are the brain and the mind the same thing? And uh, the lion's share will be what are alterations of consciousness good for? A succinct, but I hope um, thought-provoking kind of list. So anomalous experience, I'm taking that from a book we edited, it's a second edition, there is a flyer out there if anybody's interested and if you are, you may want to check uh, Amazon rather than the flyer by APA because it may be cheaper through Amazon. For those who are interested in art, the cover is by Remedios Baro, a Mexican-Spanish painter who was very very focused, very interested in alterations of consciousness and integrating it into her art. That particular image is called Breaking the Vicious Circle and she's taking it part from her uh, Gurdjieff writings. And what we mean by anomalous, oops, sorry, what we mean by anomalous is something that is not pathological or abnormal, that is not necessarily dysfunctional. And this is an important point because in that book we end up having experts, uh, we had experts write chapters on, for example, alien abduction experiences, which are sometimes very distressing, or out-of-body experiences, mystical experience, and by and large what the literature, the literature shows is that the vast majority of people who report ostensible parapsychological phenomena or even alien abduction experiences are psychologically stable, at least as stable as the average citizen in their particular time and place. So there is no necessary connection. Maybe in the discussion, if you want, we can talk more about what may be other features that end up differentiating what is and is not a pathological condition. But just the having of unusual experiences does not pathology make. And anomalous experiences are not normal, but in the sense of a norm, in the sense of what is average in a particular culture at a particular time, given their particular ethno-epistemology. So, an anomalous experience is an, un an uncommon experience, such as synesthesia, which a number of artists have, I will give an example in a moment, and or one that is believed to deviate from ordinary experiences or accounts of reality, again in a particular culture at a particular time, such as ostensible side phenomena, such as telepathy, precognition, and so on. <coughs> Uh, first, does the ordinary state of consciousness represent reality accurately? Even before we get into how our previous karma or neurosis or personal history end up distorting the way that we end up evaluating and even perceiving what is out there, just when you look at the perceptual apparatus, you realize very easily that the ordinary state ends up misrepresenting reality in very simple ways. Of course, you can see that there, if you look at it closely, you will see movement, circular movement. There is no movement, there is no secret in this kind of, in the computer. It is just a perceptual illusion. Same thing here, this is not the best resolution, but there is an oval here and an oval there, and uh, take my word for it, it doesn't come across very well in the screen, okay? But if you were to see it here, they look very different colors. And if you take away the background, you can see that they're exactly the same. And there are all kinds of illusions that happen. John C. Lilly used to have one that was called the verbal transformation effect, in which you repeat a word again and again. And after a while, people start hearing all kinds of crazy things, or not crazy things, and it is the same word. So the ordinary consciousness is, I think, very useful for certain things. 
it is very useful if you are not trying to perceive what are very slow gradual changes or very subtle nuances if you are concerned in having your focus of attention be in many different places internal external it's not bad for that but it seems to miss many things so what I want to suggest to you is that the typical traditional definition of the normal waking state and here is one of them by a Swede and a Finn, Finnish, Kali and Revonso. Uh, for them, altered states, first they say background mechanisms outside the phenomenal contents of consciousness that are inside the brain. We have already talked about that. That's the first axiom that is questionable. And modulate or realize these contents and that create phenomenal contents of consciousness that misrepresent or create delusional beliefs of the surrounding world and oneself. So in their ordinary definition, they are saying whatever other state other than the ordinary one ends up misrepresenting reality. And those, that is just an axiom, an unproved axiom they hold. I much prefer, we have another book called Altering Consciousness, there's a flyer out there, and there's a chapter by Mishara and Swartz, and they just say an altered state of consciousness disrupts our consensual common way of constructing reality. And then remain open. Some I think definitely misrepresent whatever is out there and God if I know what it is or God is if I know what it is I think that we can easily see that there are some people who are in some states that end up distorting very much but I think in the others very much we can see that people even perceive more clearly than they do in their ordinary way and that is what I will end up coming so consciousness is in the brain here is the brain of a white collar worker no, it's not this dark thing. That dark thing is just emptiness. <laughs> this is the brain, what remains of the brain. And uh, This was a white collar worker. He ended up going to neurologist because he had some uh, leg, leg weakness as an adult and they did the scan and they found out that he had almost no brain. This is it. And and he wasn't a person who uh, was mentally retarded, feeble, or anything like that. Wasn't a politician for those who are sort of <laughs> <laughs> into that. Uh, just an ordinary. And this is not the only case. There are a number of cases of people who have basically half brains who ended up because of hydrocephalia or whatever, developing only half of it. So things are as you have already been hearing through the conference are a lot more complicated than the equation. So I'm going to, my apologies, I do not know nearly as much of the Indian tradition as I know of perhaps the most quote-unquote canonical Western tradition, uh, but let me go back to Plato, which I think is also an extraordinary thinker and Iwan remembers Whitehead's notion that all of Western philosophy is just a footnote to Plato's work, exaggerated but still saying something that is worthwhile. If you are going to be dealing with altered states, you should go back to Plato. In his Phaedrus, uh, Socrates, Socrates is saying that our greatest blessings come to us by way of madness or mania. That was the original term, by mania, provided it is given us by divine gift. So he is saying that there were four ways in which we could have a greater apprehension of what there is, of the underlying reality behind the phenomenal world. One was poetic, not only in the sense of poems, but in the sense of creation, of creating new things. The other one was prophetic, and of course you have to think of the sibyls. Uh, the third one, erotic. And it doesn't refer only to sexuality, but more to the emotions of the compenetration of one person by another. Uh, or I could easily say by one being, one being by another. I don't think we should restrict it to humans. And the last one would be cathartic or initiatory, being part of a mystery, illusion, mystery. And if you think about it, this is, this is not at all a bad classification of in what kinds of ways one can end up having an altered state. And it goes back a long way. So I was talking about non-human beings and with this I want to show that not only humans like to alter their consciousness purposefully and willingly. 
uh, birds end up preferring fermented fruits than other fruits because they get a bit intoxicated and they enjoy it. Fortunately, they don't have licenses, so they can't do <laughs> the kind of damage that we end up doing. <laughs> and here's a big kitty, and unfortunately, you cannot see his face very well, but he, he's high. He's, you, <laughs> if you could see, his, he's really high because he has been eating some catnip uh, the equivalent. So, and, well, and I, have, I have always had cats, and they enjoy it. So it's not only humans who like to alter their consciousness, and I think there are a number of reasons for that. So let me get into that one. The first one, since we have coffee and tea out there, okay? <laughs> so drink coffee, do stupid things faster with more energy. That's, I dr drank some coffee before starting the lecture. Uh, uh, with this slide, what I wanted just to point out is that even though I'm talking about altered experiences or anomalous experiences or altered state of consciousness, that really one should be talking in more general terms about what we do to alter consciousness. Maybe you know, yeah, got it, thank you. To alter your consciousness and there are just the mild everyday ways in which we do it. I mean quite literally drinking coffee or tea or if you are tired, you will go to the cinema just a couple of steps away and find out what it is. So we are all the time doing that without people calling us droggies or anything like that, even though, in a way, we naturally do it, the same as other creatures. But if we go into more, if you will, intense ways, what are alterations in consciousness good for? Well, one that I don't think is trivial at all, and I heard that one of the responses of the Dalai Lama for what is the purpose of life was to live, to be happy. And I think part of living, of course, this should be extended enormously. Uh, but I think part of it is to really use the kind of gifts that we have, including sensory experiences. I think one of the issues if you have, uh, most of you probably, if not all, have practiced meditation, or done hypnosis, or being in a sensory deprivation context, you know that one of the things that can happen is that after the experience, you come back to the room and you see it anew. <laughs> Sense. It is, yes, you had not paid attention to that tapestry, but now you see the intricate pattern it has. And you see the complexity in the walls and all of the wonderful array of colors just beside you. And it's something that because you had juxtaposed, I said in a sense, concepts instead of direct experience, you forget about it or you do not do it, or if you are not doing phenomenal work on yourself all the time, you stop doing it and you end up dealing with concepts rather than what there is there. And of course, enjoying having sensory experiences, thanks to that we are here, because if orgasm is an altered state. It is a brief altered state, but when you are having that, you are definitely not typically aware or conscious the way that you ordinarily are. And if we did not have that sensory experience, probably the species would not have been perpetuated. We would not be here. So we do not think about it, but Altered states help us to perpetuate, but it also helps us as well in whom we choose to be our mate. Because I hope you all have had the experience of knowing that when you really fall in love, you are not in your ordinary state. You are with a person, the sense of time is very different. I uh, you know we have to be checking at the, the clock in the airport because you do not know if it has been 30 seconds or 10 minutes, have no idea. You have forgotten even where, where you were, what you were going to do. Uh, so they end up helping us enjoy life more. They help us actually perpetuate the, uh, the species. And in a perhaps not as important way, but still, if you want to, to talk to one of your cognitive colleagues, they can enhance cognitive abilities. A lot of the meditation research that is being done has been showing that, that long-term meditators are better at a number of things. One of the older studies by Dan Brown and collaborators show that the phi illusion, that is the illusion when you are having flashes of light, and if you have the interval 
time just well, you will see a sequence of movement. Instead of seeing light going on and off, you see a movement of light. That even though you know that you are having an illusion, you are not able to do it, but meditators were able to decrease that effect. And I'm sure that by now there are many other examples that people can talk about. But another example, synesthesia, which I had not really defined uh, other than in the general definition. Synesthesia is when you end up experiencing in more than one modality what ordinarily most people experience in one modality. So please assume, even though it is not it, that this word is only written in black. So if it were only written in black, most of you would see it in black. But maybe in this audience there might be one person who would see it in colors. They are having every time that they see a letter in black or a word, they see colors associated with it or with numbers, sorry, or with numbers. And there are many other ways of synesthesia. Or people may listen to music and see colors with it. Some of the great composers, artists uh, have this ability. I envy them. I, I, I love music, but I only hear it. I do not also have this color movement. We know that synesthesia enhances memory because you, yes, because you end up having not only the typical modality through which you have the information, you have in two or maybe even three modalities. So if you see a person, a uh, person's name, uh, whatever, Madeline, you not only have Madeline, but in addition, Madeline tasted like, uh, why, like strawberry. So next time you see it, it's both Madeline and strawberry, and it's easy to remember that it's Madeline because See, hmm, she tastes like strawberry, so it must be Madeline. So it enhances memory. We know that dreaming helps with processing of memories, especially emotional memories, it seems. So if you do not dream, you may not be able to recall as well what happened during the day or process that information. So alterations can help in many ways. Uh, and another important one is that they can enhance creativity. Going back to Plato, poetic mania. Okay. Uh, and that is just one example that is from uh, Nobel Prize winner Kerry Mollis. He did a discovery of the polymerase chain reaction. Don't ask me what it is, please. <laughs> that's, that's what it is. <laughs> okay. It has to do with the structure of DNA. And uh, Kerry Mollis was into all kinds of altered states, including some drug induced, but not only drug induced. And he describes in his autobiography how he came up with that model through one of his visions. And it is by no means the only person. This is, of course, not to say that if you do not have the requisite background knowledge, that you just drug yourself and you will become the next Einstein. Of course, that doesn't happen. You need the background information. But I think what altered states can do, and they do, is that if you have end up being stuck, you have some problem that through your ordinary consciousness, you cannot find a solution, what altered states can do or anomalous experience is release you, allow you to see things in a way that you had not seen them or apprehend them in a way you had not apprehended them before, either symbolically or not, and you may come with something like this. By the way, let me just mention, because it is in the net and you should not trust everything that is in the net, that somebody has written that Watson uh, had ended up coming with the structure of DNA out of a dream. Uh, and I checked it. I checked it with the archives that have the Watson papers. Not true, even though <laughs> he does have in one of his books something about talking that in the institutes they had a staircase that was like a snake. But I think somebody just misremembered what happened, but I found no evidence for that. But, but we do not need that. We have that. Uh, Job said that one of the most important things when he was coming up with Apple was that he had done drugs. And there are many people like that. You find it among artists, many different, of, I mean, different types of artists. We have worked a bit on that. And just to give you a smaller example, a study that came a couple of years ago by Jaro Shetal found that alcohol intoxication can help enhance verbal associations. It loosens up a bit. Again, which I think partly, by no means it explains it all, but partly may explain why some writers end up 
shall we say, abusing a bit alcohol. Because it may be that you are trying to come up with different ways of saying things. And of course, if we are using language, as we tend to use it instrumentally, to say little things in everyday lives, language is normally constrained. You go drink too much, maybe tonight or wherever, and you may end up having some associations that you had not had before. And if you are a person who has a great vocabulary, so you may end up having ideas and ways of relating words that you had not before. So alterations can help you with creativity, I would say especially probably when you are intoxicated. And they can help treat a number of conditions. Okay. Uh, that is an example uh, by Andrew Mason. He is, uh, this is decades ago, and I put it because it is very dramatic, but there are more everyday examples like this. This is a patient he had, he had what he called fish scale disease. And unfortunately, because of the projector, you cannot see it, but it was just the legs completely covered by scales that looked like a fish, and that's why it was. It is a partly genetic condition, and Mason treated this person with hypnosis. And he, he was so ignorant at that time that he didn't know that, of course, hypnosis would not work with a genetic condition. And this was the result. The condition pretty much cleared. And this is not the only way. By the way, this I'm not saying that you have any kind of physical problem, we use hypnosis with you, you will be fine. No, it doesn't happen every time, but the fact is that it does happen. It does happen sometimes with conditions that have been intractable. And you end up doing something, probably it helped in his case that he was not thinking that he might fail. I think he thought, well, yes, skin condition, hypnosis is good for skin conditions, I'll use it. And it ended up working. Of course, meditation has been used, and Ronald will talk um, Roland, uh, in a few moments about the use of psychedelics, which are used for, to treat a number of different conditions. So going into an altered state can also help you if you have either medical or psychological conditions. It can enhance the sense of meaning, and again yesterday, and especially uh, the people who end up doing meditation know that is the case that if you have been, you know, I know it has happened to me before I went to session, having problems, you, are, you have an unusual experience, you suddenly have a sense that things can be different. And I think one of the most important gifts of altered states is that they show you that there are alternatives, that your way, ordinary way of experiencing may be good, but it's not the only one. And it's not the only valid one. The other ones, there are some that are maybe crazy and perhaps have no use, but there are some that are as real and that it is as real for me to experience you as part of a greater unity as it is for me to experience each one of you as a unique creature. So an example, and Peter Fenwick can talk more about that, is near-death experiences. Probably, or the most important aspect of them is their after effects. The people who have them in general increase their spirituality, not their religiosity in the sense of their following the same kind of religion they had, but being more open, more Catholic, small c, more open to other traditions, not there being an only, an only one way, but many ways. They uh, end up expressing more concern for others and the environment, appreciation for life, decreases in their fear of death and decreases in materialism and competitiveness. So, at least in my value scale, I think most people who have near-death experiences become better people than before they had them. So, they can enhance the sense of meaning and they can produce what may be perhaps arguably better people. And they expand our notions of what we are able to do. That is a Dutchman, Wolf. He is known as the Iceman because he has Guinness World Records of staying like that, buried in ice for hours. Something that people could be, would be able to last. <laughs> you don't need to imagine it. <laughs> Even if you're low hypnotizable, you don't need to imagine it, okay? Uh, uh, that he's able to withstand that. And he says that he has come to those abilities by long-term use of meditation. Now, 
I am using him not because he's the only one or the first one. The Dumo practice, you know that Tibetan monks do the same. They are putting on robes after having gone into very cold water and start steaming off. So one of the things is that either a practice, a long-term practice or even a short-term practice does show that we are able to do far more than we typically believe we can. How far, we do not know, but I think it is worth to testing. And to perhaps the more arguable one, but not so much in this group, is that they may provide a more comprehensive view of reality. That is in the case of both mystical experiences, in which people may have a sense of the interconnectedness of everything, or in the case of parapsychological phenomena, which suggest that we are more interconnected than the senses and the reason would provide of us, they suggest that we are able to have not only potential for ourselves, but also a potential to see that reality is far more interconnected. So let me get now a bit into parapsychology, which there was um, some discussion about yesterday to how some of what we do, what we know about it, and of course there will be plenty of time for discussion. Uh, so one of the things in the study of parapsychological phenomena or psi phenomena is that you know that there are extraordinary events happening in everyday life, but they are enormously difficult to grasp. So here is Victor Brauner, one of the, well, a very important surrealist painter. This is his self-portrait. As you can see, even with this projector, his eye, his left eye, because remember, a self-portrait, you are looking at the mirror, so it is reversed. So what you can see there is that his eye has fallen, left eye has fallen. And here is a photograph of him. This is a glass eye, not a real eye. I can say, so what is the big deal? He did a self-portrait of himself. What is interesting is that when he did this self-portrait, he had not lost his eye. Okay? And he did this a number of years before he lost his eyes. His eyes, sorry. He had, I have seen a number of his portraits of other people, surrealist, they are unusual, but I have only found that his self-portraits are the only one that contained his eye fallen out, enucleated. How did it happen? He was not sick. He could not normally anticipate what would happen. He lost his eye in a, in a drunken brawl between two artists' friends, <laughs> fighting with each other. It wasn't him. He tried to bring peace, and poor uh, peacemakers, one of them ended up throwing a glass, which ended up catching exactly in the canters of his eye, and that's how his eye fell. So, when this happens in everyday life, and this is by no means the only example, you say, well, it's extraordinary, but can we test it? How can we test it? We do not know. It could be a coincidence. Uh, but you say, this sounds so precise. How can we do it? Just very, yeah, I think we have time. Another example, uh, Garcia Lorca, foremost playwright poet, the foremost poet and play, Spanish poet and playwright of the 20th century. His last play is called in Spanish Así que pasen cinco años, in five years. And it is a play which, during the play, five years elapse, and the main character, who is a sensitive man, who is not able to reveal his true nature, as Garcia Lorca himself did, he was a homosexual, living in a very macho society at that time, in five years, at the end of the play, somebody shoots him, or shoots a card with a heart, but the heart represents his heart, and he dies. He dated the end of his play something like the 15th of March of 1933. Exactly five years to the day, the 15th of March of 19, what did I say, 38, exactly five years to the date, some Franco soldiers come, fetch him, and shoot him. Five years, exactly today. Coincidence? Sounds difficult to, to believe it, but how can we explore it? So what we do, uh, and there are a number of other people here who are very knowledgeable of parapsychology, when we do side research in the lab, we 
typically do not have nearly as colorful, dramatic or interesting examples, but we try to do something so that we may be able to control it a bit. So we do the same thing that we do in other areas of science. We observe something such as the Browner case, we hypothesize, well it looks like consciousness can go beyond the brain, we do research to rule out alternative explanation, we publish, we of course get blasted by the critics, and then we reformulate and do it again. And of course we get blasted by some critics who haven't even read the papers, uh, but sometimes there are some who have and have good things to do. So we use the same thing and I'll give you an example. Um, one thing that I want to say here because you hear it repeated again and again and again in the literature is that when people hear something about parapsychology, their little hair at the back of their necks just stands up and says, well yes, there may be another uh, study that found significant effects, but an exceptional claim requires exceptional proof. This gets repeated all the time. Except the people who say that typically assume, well, as Carl Sagan said, Carl Sagan said, very famous cosmologist, had a program called Cosmos. The problem is that he did not coin that phrase. That is the first mistake, and not the most important one. But that was the first mistake. The person who coined it was Marcello Truzzi, a sociologist, in an article in 78. And what he wrote is such explanations, that is explanations such as parapsychology, are quite scientifically proper if all ordinary explanations for an established extraordinary event have been found inadequate. That's what it means. It means, of course, if we are going to think whether Victor Browner was able to recognize or not, bless you, something, we first want to rule out what would seem to be reasonable explanations. Did he have an eye condition? Uh, was there, did he himself end up punching so that he would be closer to his self-portrait? Who knows? <laughs> uh, so after you have done that, then, uh, then you say, okay, well, there is no good explanation then. As Marcello Trutti says, it's perfectly proper. But this does not mean that unorthodox theories can be ignored or should be judged by different standards. Because if you think about it, this phrase is very difficult, it is completely open and it is in a sense very unscientific because it does not define what is an exceptional claim. It's completely subjective. Many of the things that we now consider to be everyday things electricity and so, were of course extraordinary claims. The ability to use all of this, some hundred years ago, people would have said, you are mad, that's an extraordinary claim. So that's the first one. Where would we be if anybody who had come with a claim that seemed to be counterintuitive was said, yeah, you have shown it a thousand times, but that's not enough. Let's have a thousand laboratories that will not be funded show to us a thousand times that that happens. So that's the first problem. And the second problem is that exceptional proof is not defined either. Okay? And so what does that mean? If we use a 0.05 significance level, does that mean a 0.01? Nobody says. A 0.001? Nobody says. And what in practice happens in parapsychology is that people just end up moving the goalpost. So before it used to be, there is no empirical proof for this. There is empirical proof for it. Not perfect. The same as there is no perfect proof for almost anything in psychology, which I know about, or for many other areas. But, okay, the scientific proof. Well, yes, but now it's not enough. <laughs> okay, well, we show you by beta analysis, I will come to that, that this gets replicated. Yes, well, but that's not enough, because an a priori conclusion is that you should show it a million times, and maybe then. I will check about it. I'm sure that if we showed it a million times, I would say, well, no, I was wrong. I meant a hundred million times, okay? Uh, so I'll just give you, you have about 10 minutes uh, before I should close here, but uh, give you an example from our lab in uh, Lund University. We use what is called the Gansfeld research, and the only important thing to know about the Gansfeld is that it gives, it gives us a homogeneous visual, auditory and sensory stimulation. What that means is there are not many changes. The, this is one of my doctoral students, he's just lying on a sofa, he's not moving, so not much stimulation information coming from his body. 
He has a couple of uh, ping pong balls with red lights in front of him. What that does is that it gives you a sort of visual field experience. You do not see edges, you do not see angles, you just see redness that does not change, which is much better than closing your eyes. You close your eyes, you have eye floaters, you start imagining things, you start daydreaming. So it is actually far better to have an homogeneous stimulation like this. And what is being played in his ears is um, white noise, the kind of noise that you hear as you are in your radio in between stations. A random frequency noise that goes shh like that, and it's unpatterned. So you are not having much information. What we know, well, first let me give you the anecdote and then I come back to, to some of, of the work. What we, uh, no, sorry, let me come back. Uh, let me go back to the Gansfeld, talking about exceptional proof. This is a cumulative heat rate for research uh, using the Gansfeld. This line implies or entails that people are choose. What happens is that when a person is in a Gansfeld, typically somebody else in another building is looking at an image. So Max is in another building, I am the participant. So after we are done, somebody who does not know what Max was looking at shows me four images or four film clips, doesn't matter. So I look at those four film clips and then I have to choose one of them, the one I think, I think that Max was looking at this one. Yeah. So the person who's showing me that, of course, doesn't know what was guessed there, what was uh, decided over there. That's chosen at random by a computer, so there is no way that I could guess what Max was seeing. It could be one out of more than 100 film clips, for instance. So if people are just guessing by chance, you should expect that they should be guessing around this, which is 25%. One out of four, 25%. What you find the cumulative heat rate, and this was a, a study just published a couple of years ago, is that even as method has gotten more stringent, as we have responded to critics and so on, people end up responding better, significantly better than chance. Not a whole lot. We do not have trained meditators like Serena who probably would do a lot better or some artists who would probably do a lot better. But the ordinary everyday person is doing more or less there, showing an effect. An effect that cannot be, cannot be explained by sensory leakage or anything of that sort. Okay, so moving right along. Uh, I said something about Gansfeld because I very briefly want to say something about hypnosis, which is the area that one of the areas that we're looking at in Lund. Because in hypnosis, we have had reports for a long time of people having what looked like ostensible parapsychological talent. Now, most of the older reports could be explained away. If, let's say, Alan and I were going to do a telepathy experiment and we were in the same room, even if observers could say, well, guess the number between 5 and 10, I tell him, and he guesses the correct one. That's a very sloppy way, because even if I'm not saying 7, 7, 7, even if I'm not doing any of that, I could be giving him a tell. That is, by maybe moving a bit this finger, even without realizing it consciously, and he might not even realize that that's the cue he's attending to, he might guess the correct one. So a lot of those earlier studies could be explained away, but by no means all, okay? By no means all. And here's a good example of Alexis Didier, very famous psychic at the time. He, wo he was working with somebody who hypnotized him, and uh, he did extraordinary things that I don't even know how to explain. Maybe you can explain. But for example, somebody would tell him, there is a book, somebody is going to choose a book in the other room, and I want you to tell me uh, what is in that room on page 13 on the 25th line. And he would come and say correct, correctly what that line was. We say, well, this sounds like a trick, because it does sound like a trick being that good. But Robert Houdin, the, very, the most famous magician of the time, 
out of whom Houdini ended up coining his name in reference to Robert Houdin, uh, Houdin looked at what he was doing and he said, I cannot replicate what he is doing. Uh, just by prestidigitation, by magic, I could not do that. So another example, a man comes to him, he has a case, uh, a Morocco case, he's holding it in his stomach, uh, Didier holds it in his stomach and he says, the object within the case is a hard substance. It is folded in an envelope. The envelope is wider than the thing itself. It's kind of ivory, a bone taken from your body, cut so as to leave a flat side. He opens the case. There is a bone. It is a bone by the person who had given him the case. And the bone was encased in a silver shiny paper. And he continues, oh, that was an extraordinary bullet. You received three separate injuries at the same time. You were wounded in the early part of the day while charging the enemy, all of which it turned out to be right. Okay. So there are observations like that, careful observations, that I would say are very difficult to explain away. At least I cannot. And I have not read of any skeptic who could explain away. There were many frauds and so on, but there were also these ones. So as far as just starting to closing this here, research on hypnosis and psi, more generally I won't go into all of this except to say that there are meta-analyses that have shown that there is a relationship. That generally speaking, when people are in a hypnosis condition and they are put in a controlled, perhaps psychological test, they do better than when they are in a non-hypnosis condition. Uh, you can check these references and we will have a book in a few months where you can, we can update you on that. And what is most important, I would say, for what we are talking about here, is this of a study we published a couple of three years ago now. And we did a Gansfeld experiment. Same thing that I did, it was telepathy. There was a friend of the person who was supposed to choose the correct clip in another building. And we had thought that people who were highly hypnotizable, people who are very responsive to hypnosis, would do better than people who were not. And here is the most interesting thing. What we found is that just looking at high hypnotizables versus low hypnotizables, how good they were, didn't pan out. But what, what panned out was that when people who were highly hypnotizable, using an introspective a, a questionnaire, using a questionnaire, when they reported that they were in an altered state, this is, I'm not in an altered state at all, I'm wide awake, I'm completely asleep, I have been just listening to Edsel too long, okay? So if you were in an altered state, you did a lot better. This is a scale that shows whether you are choosing the correct clip. You are giving a higher score to the correct clip. So the more you are saying that you're in an altered state, the better you are doing, the better you are choosing the correct target. I hope that, is, that was clear. Uh, so we are pursuing this, but I think here we have a clear connection between being in an altered state and getting there. being in an altered state and having psi phenomena. David Luke has a very good article just reviewing that this not only happens in hypnosis, it happens in dreams. Just a, a quick, uh, well, no, let me pass on that. It happens in dreams, it happens in meditation, and since yesterday somebody mentioned William James, I would like to go back to him because he's another one of my, well, he's my hero in this regard. And this is, of course, a citation, a quotation that has been cited many, many places, but it's worth for those of you who may not have come across of it. And it's a normal waking consciousness is but one ty special type of consciousness. While all about it parted from it by the filmiest of screen, there lie potential forms of consciousness entirely different. We may go through life without suspecting their existence, but apply the requisite stimulus and at a touch they are there in order completeness. And here, and somewhere they have their field of application and adaptation. So he was of course also anticipating what they, some of them of course are good for something. No account of the universe in its totality can be final, which leaves quite untouched these other forms of consciousness discarded. 
So at 44 minutes and 44 seconds, I end. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'll go this way. Just let me mention that I have on the back there, there is an article called The Call for an Open uh, Study of Consciousness that Max and other people have signed and it was published in different tiers of um, human uh, neuroscience and it is co-signed by a hundred professors, hundred academics including from very slop institutions like Stanford, Oxford, Berkeley, University of London, even Lund University in Sweden. So they are back there, completely free, <laughs> so if you're interested, go on there. And, and it has references, because I just mentioned uh, meta-analysis, but there are many meta-analyses. Serena. Thank you very much, Edsel, very well, clear, clear presentation. Thanks. Um, slightly aside from it, but connecting with the discussion that happened yesterday, um, you just mentioned meta-analysis mm -hmm. and we were discussing yesterday the difficulty in parapsychology of getting published in mm. what one might call reputable journals and Daryl Bem, who is um, Cornell University Professor of Social Psychology and highly regarded within his field, he's done a meta-analysis of some precognition experiments that he was running mm -hmm. and just yesterday afternoon while we were having our discussion he had a rejection from an APA journal for his meta-analysis of oh. his precognition studies and I thought what an example to bring to this group that we're not talking about inadequate research we're not talking about people mm -hmm. who don't know what they're doing we are talking about high quality research mm -hmm. from high status, high quality people being <coughs> rejected. And the rejection from the journal was from the editor. He hadn't even sent it out for review. And he had said, it's because this topic is of little interest. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> I had two of those myself yesterday. <laughs> Well, congratulations so or, or not. To, uh, to, to, to just as an example, you, a synchronistic example. While yeah. we were discussing it yesterday, this was actually happening. Yeah, absolutely right. And coming to you. Uh, I think one thing that one can do is try to be sneaky and sort of be guerrilla as far as getting into journals. That, the journal that published the call we ended up proposing uh, some kind of special issue on non-ordinary mental expressions. And besides publishing that, uh, I was editor in a couple of other papers, one that found evidence for Psy, one that didn't, but they got published. I think they have now gotten smart and the editor-in-chief has stopped others. But I think as, as far as politics, one, one needs to do, which this does happen, is to get into journals, do the reviewing of normal, ordinary things and sneak things. And try to comment, yes. That's what also is the editor of the book on anomalous experience, which is uh, published by the American Psychological Association. I know this because I was asked to, <laughs> Thank you. to have a look at it. So he's right in the center of the establishment in terms of where he's been working. Sneaky. <laughs> there and then, no, Peter was next, and then you, and then you. Yes, Peter. Uh, I just want to visit again this question of no brain. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> what you couldn't see in that slide, uh, because of the lighting, is that all the subcortical structures are in fact intact. So what has happened is that the ventricles have very slowly, because it's from birth, pushed out like this, and there's been compression of the brain substance around it. Mm -hmm. But the deeper structures mm -hmm. are all intact, and so you can't. What you what you can get from that is that the brain is, is able to adapt if you change it slowly. And the compression of mm -hmm. the cerebral layers doesn't necessarily inhibit their function. So if you'd done an EEG on this guy, which we don't have, mm -hmm. it probably would have been normal. And I think it's, it's not a good example to choose for um, no brain. What it is a very good example to choose is that the brain can adapt if you change it slowly 
And you probably will have all have seen recently that the idea of mechanical forces uh, in the synapse is also now an important method of transferring information. So th these are obviously conserved with very slow compression as well as electrical activity. And so we can't say he hasn't got no brain. No. We can say he's got, in fact, an adapted brain. But you look at that slide and you think, wow. <laughs> no brain. It's not like that. No, I, I, I partly, <laughs> partly will go with you, but uh, partly not, because I think it goes against the mechanical equation of you must have an intact full brain. You can have people that have only one hemisphere. You can say, yes, it is adapted, but nonetheless, they are able to function very well. So the relationship, I think there is a relationship very clearly. I don't think anybody here would deny it, but the relationship is more complex than a typical just token kind of relationship, which was really my main point. So not, not completely no brain. Yeah, but, I, I mean, I'm going to accept okay. that, obviously, because mm -hmm. if you have one hemisphere, then you can perform a whole lot of functions perfectly well on it. It depends at what age. Mm -hmm. If it's before seven, then you can get a huge amount of uh, restoration of function into what, brain fun into what brain is left. If it's after seven, then um, you get you huge get. deficits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's very much a relationship between the time of injury, what the brain can do to restore function. Um, but it's not a good example. Okay. <laughs> 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 I think it, it has been effective for me, but uh, Alan, you wanted to. I'm just wondering, really quickly, Lorimer's earlier paper, the English um, physician who did a study of uh, 600 people with uh, hydrocephalus mm. and finding some had only 10% brain, the rest was fluid, and had uh, IQs about, what, about 100. Do you know that study? Uh, yes, I, I know that study, but it's too long ago because we don't actually have MRI scans on it and things like that, so we don't actually know what the subcortical structures are like. Mm -hmm. And so although you can uh, look at the cortex, and say it's compressed, you don't know what the functioning of the subcortical structures are. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really difficult to argue from mm -hmm. that. I do have a uh, let me just came to you first, it was Alina, and then to you, and then you. Yes. No, he's, he's still got his question. I do have one question to you. Oh, okay. In, yeah, go, go. Yeah, that no, was good. You've just made this reference to uh, hypnotizability. Yes. Do you know if there's any, any study done of the correlation, a possible correlation, with people with high hypnotizability? and their, how do you say, placebo effect. Some people have a very strong placebo effect. Mm -hmm, Relationship? Yeah, there's some relationship. I think the last there is some relation. I think the last paper was with Irving Kirsch was one of the co-authors. There's some relation. It is not a very strong correlation, but there was some significant one. But there is. Sure. Now, Lena. Sorry. Um, well, I really wanted just to um, echo what Serena was saying and tying up uh, Jonathan's talks and your wonderful, very engaging talk Thank today. You. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> it's also very, very um, engaging. And, and it's sort of two slightly different uh, messages. Both are important. So we do have to design rigorous experiments. But one of the things that I think these workshops are so important for and what they can bring forth in, in the world of scientific community is systematically, rigorously working towards challenging the mainstream view, you know, we, we can be coming up with thousands of perfectly conduct, conducted experiments, um, but if the goalposts are continuously moving by the skeptics, um, this is not going to lead us anywhere. And this affects us on a personal level as well, in the mm -hmm. sense that, you know, we can have an exceptional experience, but if the doubt is so strong that it's dismissed as, a, as an anomaly, um, it, it ripples, you know, from a personal level, it ripples to the societal level. And we see that with global warming. I mean, how much proof do we need? But if it's not fitting within our comfort zone, we dismiss it. So mm -hmm. it, it, we're not just talking about um, the skepticism of accepting exceptional claims. We're talking about shifting and really, really strongly entrenched mm -hmm. fear-controlled views and paradigms that the mainstream holds on to because it requires an incredibly courageous shift in how we perceive ourselves in the world. 
And I think the systematic, not attack, I don't want to use strong words, but the systematic move, which en encompasses philosophers, neuroscientists, um, social psychologists within the mainstream, in addition to the rigorously controlled experiments, in addition to the political trickery and sneakery that we can perform, it has to be an honest challenge of what the mainstream paradigm is. And we have to turn uh, the heads uh, and the minds uh, of of our critics and skeptics into open-minded skeptics. Um, and I sort of can speak for myself as a young neuroscientist, relatively young neuroscientist, the, the hoops that we have to jump through, you know, and we're talking about our lives here and our careers. You know, it's, we can be as courage, courageous and determined as we can, but there's only so much every single individual can do, particularly mm -hmm. if they're not in a very friendly environment, let's put it that way. So we have to work on different levels. It can't be just controlled experiments or edited issues. And for example, in a place like Institute of Psychiatry, where I'm based, publishing in a special issue would be seen in, well, in a special issue, you can publish anything, you know, mm -hmm. if you had a friendly editor. Again, it's going to be dismissed. And you know, I see it on a daily basis where I work, because I'm not quite fitting in into the uh, biomedical paradigm that is dominant in my institution. So I, I think the message you are conveying is very, very important, and I hope we can all sort of work on that level within the academic community, just challenging that <coughs> claim that it has to be <coughs> extraordinary proof is needed for extraordinary claims. I think that's very important to dissuade that yeah. uh, conviction amongst our scientific groups. So. Exactly. Uh, I, I agree with what you said and I think as far as what, what one can do intelligently in a sense to try to get into it is, uh, we have talked about this in parapsychology community, is I probably have been able to do a lot more because I did not start doing parapsychology research and probably the fact that I was doing a postdoc at Stanford on dissociation which is it's not a lady, but it is not as disreputable as <laughs> parapsychology, or a lord, so not to, not to be sexist. I think the fact that I became known for that, I think allowed me to then start later on talking about other things. So I, what I have found out is, if you show people, yes, I know what you're talking about, and in addition, there is this, maybe you will listen to me. This is true, but we also know of examples of a very established scientist, when they start going towards the age, they mm -hmm. just label loopy, you know, they've mm -hmm. gone off the rails, <laughs> and that's what's said by their colleagues. Mm -hmm. we, know, we know people. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> new to whom that happened. Yes. And new yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm sort of coming back to my point that it has to be shipped from within. The True, absolutely. Thank you. Yes, you. Thank you. Um, I just heard this morning that um, there was a cake for me uh, yesterday evening <laughs> on my, my birthday, and I do apologize for not being uh, present. I had lots of friends and family having rice style on subji last night. Uh, uh, so I uh, had to leave a little bit early. Uh, I had a lovely evening, a genuine altered state of consciousness, I have to say, very <laughs> friends. Um, what, what I'd just like to ask, if I may, um, you have, had mentioned about these shifts of consciousness and two or three which immediately came to mind. Uh, one, of course, was uh, the lovely coffee and teas that we have, or, or to uh, alcohol. But isn't it important at times to um, introduce um, the area of ethics into the changes of consciousness? Because uh, sometimes, of course, uh, with the variety of chains of consciousness, it can become uh, very, very destructive. Mm -hmm. and in fact, um, harmful for uh, not only the individual, but the family and friends. There. And I'd like to hear your quick voice on that. Um, and uh, secondly, of course, in the tradition of the meditators and the yogi, um, the absence of the stimulus um, is very healthy and helpful. And as you pointed out, in the changes of consciousness in meditation and much else, tremendous uh, creativity can uh, emerge through the absence of any kind of stimulus. So mm -hmm. one is on the ethics and uh, mm -hmm. one is on the, the value of the mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm absolutely right on the ethical issue. Because of the constraints of time, uh, I did not end up doing something that uh, I thought I could do. And that is that for every positive example, mm -hmm of an altered state, I could offer a negative example. 
So for the positive enhances life through the sensory qualities and intensity, you have the drug addict. Uh, what Jim probably will talk about, for, for an example in which you can have a sense that you are greater than yourself, that you are just one entity, you have the Nuremberg Nazi rallies of 1933, where you were a little thing of some monstrous thing that became later on. So, without a doubt, all of these have altered states, the same as the ordinary state, have risks. I think probably the worst things have come in our ordinary state, but that does not mean that in our ordinary <coughs> state. So, absolutely right that there has to be an ethical consideration throughout all of them. And in fact, when you're in an altered state, I think that you should not worry about that. For me personally, uh, maybe the first time that I did psychedelics as an adult and so on, um, it sort of bumped into my mind that yes, I'm feeling these extraordinary things, but I also better keep track that I do not damage anybody or myself. And this I had to remind myself because it was very easy to just go with the extraordinary sensation of the moment. Um, and as far as having no stimulus, yes, I, Gansfeld, there were three people, Chuck Onerton and, and other, who came up with that idea in perhaps psychology, but I think what it does is allow you to create, come up with new things. This is completely anecdotally, but I know that in the evenings when I meditate, I have far more interesting rich dreams than, and I don't watch TV almost at all, but in the rare case when I end up watching <coughs> TV, um, dreams are very banal. So I can assume that for most people who are in front of the TV set six hours, all of the, they have left the production of the images to somebody else, and mostly the production is trivial stuff that is trying to sell you things and conform to a very narrow range of what is normal. Thanks. Andreas? I was just um, uh, I wanted you to add something Elena said about, about changing, changing the public perception of uh, yeah, especially um, um, stuff that, that happens at the fringe of, of science. And one, one, one thing to, to remember is uh, historically, of course, the um, Revolutions always came from from the French, even in so-called mainstream science. And the other thing is, um, if you look at the way public opinion about about, about those controversial things is, is is being shaped and upheld. <coughs> um, uh, for example, the um, skeptics movements, they are absolutely brilliant at networking. They mm -hmm. uh, actively mm -hmm. recruit journalists. They um, uh, award prizes for uh, so-called um, um, responsible journalism, which uh, basically <laughs> is uh, <laughs> um, uh, spreading the most simplistic images of, of, of uh, uh, scientific practice uh, about how science works. You know, and, and what really astonishes me is that um, especially in parapsychology, um, I think only few people know how, um, how many high quality data there are. So what, uh, uh, <coughs> but what really hasn't happened in, in, in parapsychology is uh, um, a concerted effort in, in, in really counteracting those uh, mm -hmm. skeptical machinations you know, mm -hmm. and, and try to really do some, some uh, well thought through um, public relations work, which, and the thing is, you know, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a, um, a preconception about uh, the popularization of, uh, of science, that it, uh, it's necessarily shallow, but I, I don't really think so. I mean, mm -hmm. Even William James uh, was uh, not a friend of uh, newspaper science, as he called mm -hmm. it. You know. <coughs> He did publish a few mm -hmm. uh, papers in, in, in sure. yeah. science magazines and then really uh, put his cards on the table and said, uh, I'm absolutely convinced that um, those phenomena are real. I have no, no real uh, theory, but uh, I think I as a scientist being responsible at uh, taking those results seriously, especially if they come from, uh, from a um, trained scientist. You know, and, mm -hmm. um, yeah. 
And of course, as a historical footnote, there is nothing new in history. I mean, um, William James spearheaded um, a fairly discreet uh, brand of, of experimental psychology during the <coughs> infancy of um, psychology as a science, which really tried to integrate those experience into, into mm -hmm. um, yeah, with, with, to make sense um, in a wider perspective with the fairly undisputed phenomenon. And, uh, and that's one, one, mm -hmm. of my, one of my themes yeah. in, my, in, my, in, my, in my work that there really was, during the agency <coughs> of uh, um, modern psychology, a specific <coughs> and But you don't read anything in, in, in regular history of uh, psychology about these uh, topics, which, which were um, extensively discussed at the, at the five first international conference mm -hmm. of um, experimental psychology, which is a happen. Mm -hmm. We don't yeah. read anything, well, just, just tiny footnotes, but people don't really grasp the mm -hmm. significance of, yeah. of those uh, developments. And, yeah. and of course, the way it uh, became um, fairly quickly um, yeah, dismissed after mm -hmm. James's death. Uh, yeah, and partly because of Pierre Janet, who himself did studies uh, uh, that <coughs> gave evidence for what looked like telepathy in hypnosis with Leoni, or the pseudonym Leoni, and then I think he wisely, professionally decided, I better yeah. stop doing this work if and I want to have. And interestingly, the, the guy who, uh, who actually coined the term uh, parapsychologie in, in, in Germany, Max Isouard, um, very, very similar story. Um, um, he coined the term as a student, and, and he was highly active in, in, in uh, psycho research in uh, <coughs> in one one of the one of the largest uh, psychological societies in uh, Germany. And he coined the term parapsychology as a I think when he was nineteen <laughs> or something. And he conducted experiment in extrasensory perception, uh, and from his early publications. You, you can tell um, he was absolutely convinced the stuff is real. He was collaborating with the Society for Psycho Research, publishing the proceedings even. <coughs> and uh, but when he got his PhD, he completely reversed. Yeah. And of course, mm -hmm. there was an attack by Wilhelm Wundt, uh, and that and, and then he really really uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. changed his mind. He never he never explained why he suddenly didn't believe in the. Mm -hmm. Validity of his, his own experiments, basically. But he, uh, yeah. and, and there are, and, and that's just the there are many. Tip yeah, and, and if I can take this and sort of unite it also with what you were saying, Alina, uh, something that may be a bit of help. I completely agree that we have been terrible at public relations. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, some things, and I think it goes up and down a bit. There have been good developments insofar as at least psi open, psi receptive uh, articles have come out in Salon which is a very popular magazine, in the Times Educational Supplement in the UK, and what is the third one I'm missing? And in the New York Times, I think. Yes, Barbara Ehrenreich was talking about her mystical experience. <coughs> so one of the things that I have done, and you're welcome to write to me for a copy, anybody who is interested, is in Minefield, what I have been doing is putting on a list of eminent people in other areas than parapsychology who have done research or themselves or at least support it. And so far, it's more than 25 Nobel Prize winners, some literature, some science, uh, and more than 120 very eminent people. You do EEG, you should know that Berger created EEG to try to detect telepathy, for example. But in any case, I did that partly because I was curious, but I think the other was, especially for young researchers, to be able to say, you think I'm crazy? Well, so are these other people. So it's this <laughs> long list of people. <laughs> so it is not crazy. Jonathan was next, and then you. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Oh, this is uh, just a tiny uh, factoid. You mentioned uh, near-death experiences. And you might find it interesting that the uh, little research on Plato, that pole star uh, experiment I talked about, that's in the middle of uh, a long, detailed uh, near-death experience that Plato was describing. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. At the end of the Republic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. There was, there was you. Yes. Uh, thank you first for a very careful laying out of the playing field. Thanks. 
Um, Rupert Sheldrake uh, published a book a number of years ago titled, I think, Seven Experiments mm -hmm. to Change the World. My recollection is that he intended that to encourage a large number of professional and amateur replications. What came of it? Well, I think we were talking with uh, <laughs> Serena. I don't know. Uh, and I honestly don't think that there is one experiment that will change the world. I think, I think that there, no, that you would, if you want to, for example, do something, you need to do five experiments, publish five experiments, go to ten conferences. And after some pe enough people have heard you, you may have a bit of an effect. But I think it is naive to think there is one study that toppled behaviorists. There wasn't. My, my there was possibly faulty memory of it. It was not so much the assertion that there would be one experiment or seven experiments. Uh -huh. But here are some number of things. Which of the large enough people, including amateurs, mm -hmm. took them on? Yeah. It would not be seven experiments. It would be seven yeah. okay. thousand yeah. mm -hmm. replications. Mm -hmm. So this seemed to be an, um, an effort on his part mm -hmm. to increase the general public's receptivity to the message. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder what happened, if anything. Well, it did. It did? Okay, well, we yes, it did. Uh, Rupert, in fact, uh, carried some of the ideas forward himself with his telephone telepathy, do dogs know when their owners are coming home, and all these ones. And so it raised the public experience of that. but. Uh, just talk to any skeptic about do you know do dogs know when their owners are coming home? And they say yes. They can hear the engine six <laughs> miles off. <laughs> <laughs> so it's ridiculous. But uh, Rupert has been extremely good at mm -hmm. pointing us in these directions and raising public consciousness. But as far as ch changing the paradigm, it's a bottom-up process mm -hmm. rather than. A, a clear set of experiments which will do it. Yeah, uh, and oh, okay, Some, something else. I do not believe, here is just my viewpoint, probably many may disagree. I do not believe in paradigms or changes of paradigms. I think always throughout history there has been a pressure and a tension between people who, sorry, I, I'm coming to you, yeah. between people who wanted to be, as David Back and my mentor would say, methodolatrists. I want to do a method that may not have anything to do with the actual substance of my question and I remain very tagged into the simplest explanations and people who were willing to not think that they had the truth but to at least concede that things were a lot more complex and more complicated than they were. I think this has always been the case and honestly I think it will always remain the case. I don't think we are going to topple anybody. I think at most what will happen is some people here will get more tenure jobs, there will be more people in the UK who are open to this and just gradually increase. But I think materialists or whatever you want to call it, uh, reductionists, will still be here in 300 years if there is an earth to be <laughs> where people can still go. I think they will still be here nonetheless. And even within that group, I think we have to make distinctions because I have read some materialist accounts where they say there's only matter that are beautiful, that are thinking about the mystery and the reverence for all there is. And I much prefer that kind of account that someone who's telling me all about ghosts and so on and is not relating to how he or she or we all are polluting everything that happens. So I honestly don't think that paradigm has helped us very much. I think we can help increase the ratio of people who are being more respected or are not being as punished as much. It's that. working within the ethics of science, really. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Not even paradigmatic shift. It's yeah. holding true what science is, having the open-mindedness mm -hmm. to use the method without yeah. an allegiance to any particular ontological framework. As yeah. you said, you know, metaphysics, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. should yeah. That's the whole message that needs to be taken seriously. Green. Andreas, David, you, yes. Yeah. But I think it's also really, really important to, uh, to uh, I mean, of course, if, if there is an opportunity to, uh, to uh, really make change in, in, in the current system, as uh, the thing is, you know, science at the moment is a profession. Mm -hmm. okay? And that is, uh, and a lot of people forget that. That's, that is a very, very recent development. And I think it's, it's worth, worthwhile to keep in mind that um, there are 
maybe alternative to, to professionalize science as we are accustomed to it. And, and uh, it's all, all, uh, also worthwhile remembering that a uh, large part of the so called scientific revolution happened outside the university. Francis Bacon was in the university man. Mm -hmm. The founder of the Royal Society in London, Dr. Boyd, was not a university man. And, 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 and the, the whole impetus of, of, of the new experimental paradigm happened in uh, protest mm -hmm. um, against uh, scholasticism. Which was perceived as very, very. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, no. It's, it has to be so through many fronts. I don't have any concrete um, suggestions to, to just, uh, of how to develop such uh, institutional alternatives, but I think it's uh, fatal, especially in, in parapsychology. Mm. Um, and I have the impression that happens a lot to really um, try to, to make to change the system uh, because the way um, the, the universities develop with, with, with an increasing focus on, on um, funding only for applied sciences mm. Mm -hmm. like yeah. Yeah. we have to go. and that trend I think is very very difficult to reverse mm -hmm. and that's one one more reason why I think it's, it's really, really important yeah. to think of I don't. possible alternative I'm, yeah. I'm not saying that the, yeah, no, but but one has to look at many, and and I think sorry, David, you <laughs> no, and you sorry, so you're next. Uh, sorry, my no, no, Rupert, my apologies. You're coming. No, next I, now. I just wanted to throw out an observation in the, this discussion, uh, um, or a, a story from early Buddhist text. There's a story um, of the Buddha where one of his uh, enthusiastic lay disciples comes to the Buddha and says, why don't you get one of your monks to perform a wonder, to walk on water, to, mm -hmm. to fly through the air or whatever? If you do that, the um, various, you know, people will think, wonderful, marvelous, you know, we're really impressed, we'll come and follow you. And the Buddha replies, no, that's not what will happen. He says, those who already are enthusiastic, and, uh, and my followers will say, fantastic, wonderful, those who are skeptical will just say, there's a trick yeah. which <laughs> makes you do this. <laughs> uh, you know. The more things so change. The, 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 this <laughs> argument has, you know, has been... Coming to you after David. <laughs> David, yeah. Okay, so yeah. I think it's going to you know, an interesting point to make about taboo in, in science and that I, I kind of come I've kind of committed a double career, Harry Carey, by taking an interest in parapsychology and in psychedelics. But over the last kind of 10 or 15 years, you've seen research in, in psychedelics become, you know, not so taboo, and it's actually become quite respectable in, in them. Not completely respectable, it's still a little bit taboo, obviously, but it, it's become uh, more popular within, within science. And that's for various reasons. Um, for one thing, it doesn't necessarily challenge kind of materialist reductionism. In fact, you know, on, on the surface of it, it seems like it, you look at how the brain is a, the mind is affected by chemical influences, it may even support it on the surface of things. So there's, you know, there's various reasons why maybe psychedelics has become more acceptable within science and parapsychology is, is still struggling to kind of attain that acceptance. It's less of a kind of uh, political taboo. We've got, probably got political and kind of within science taboos against parapsychology going on. But it means that, I think the point is that just because it's a taboo now doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a taboo in, in the future. I think things are changing. And actually going back to the idea that psychedelic research is ongoing, now it's starting up again, is actually probably part of the solution to that. And that's going to be a massive Pandora's box opening up where people are going to be having much more of these kinds of experiences. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how psychedelic research became respected in the yep. as well. Is that people, enough people had had those experiences, realised that the taboo was rather a myth, actually. I think the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and if I link, I'm coming to you. Uh, and if I link both, both of you, I th one thing I believe is not useful, and I have seen this in Sweden, where is that before I arrived there, <coughs> their strategy was, in a sense, to be completely cautious and, in a sense, defensive when talking about perhaps psychology. And I think. Uh, if these are the people who are working, are coming across as not being certain of any of that, or not certain, but at least of believing that there is something to it, why should anybody else believe? So 
I think we need to have, be more assertive, not in the sense of, yes, we know all the answers or even any of the answers, but we know the information, I can talk your language and within your language I can reply to you. When you're saying that only crooks think this or frauds, let me give you a list of that. And you want to talk about brain imaging, well, I'll talk about this, that we need to be much more proactive in that sense. Yes, you and you. Uh, Elena, yes. Getting self conscious and taking too much space in the discussion, but I, I really wanted to um, convey this. Um, I've been teaching on the mind brain module and one of the MSCs uh, at the Institute of Psychiatry for seven years now. And I do a very simple uh, presentation of the main kind of ontological positions of mind and body with a simple diagrams for the students. And they go through materialism, idealism, um, uh, Cartesian so substance dualism, so property. Dualism, and um, I also present them with the Einsteinian view that it's a kind of mm -hmm. language problem. And interestingly, seven years ago, a majority of the students would vote for materialism. Now, in the last two years, not a single student did. So, and those are the students at the Institute of Psychiatry. Yes, we're talking about the, the European <laughs> state of biomedical tradition. So, we are getting the young generation that are starting to think differently. Mm -hmm. And where we have to be uh, very much on the, on, the, um, on the tip of our toes is to provide them with an alternative. Because as soon as they drop one view, that uh, one view, which is a very simple view in many ways, you know, if you adhere to material reductionism, it's, uh, uh, things are a lot simpler uh, within neuroscience, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and also it's a very attractive idea for many people, actually, that once death happens, the switch is off and there is nothing else to worry about. Mm -hmm. your life to the pool. So it's challenging that as well. But once they're ready to drop it, what is going to come into its place? And that sort of Cartesian anxiety that Francisco Varela talked in this embodied mind, that's a real personal experience, anxiety that arises for people. It's sort of teaching this new generation of whatever philosophers, neuroscientists, physicists, how to write that in the experience without settling to any particular view as a scientist hold the question but don't come up straight away with an answer don't, mm -hmm. don't satisfy that anxious need to have a particular view to hold on to because if anything if we are in this what we know is that we do not know exactly. almost anything so we have to teach young generation <coughs> to be comfortable in that mm -hmm. without the fear anxiety but with compassion curiosity yeah. and intellectual Mm -hmm. Absolutely agree. Then get the last two, I think we have time. Let me go first with him, then get, since he hasn't talked. Yes, go. Thank you very much. Avant. <laughs> you know, I hesitate a, a little bit to ask this question because I, I realize that it is a little bit uh, out of the consensus in this room. My, my point is that uh, maybe the reason why uh, you know, the parapsychologic uh, studies are so difficult to convey in a, a scientific community is maybe that there is a sort of category mistake here that uh, we try to, uh, to give a scientific and objective meaning to something that might have another completely different meaning uh, which, is, uh, which, is, which has to do with subjective experiences with things that, uh, that from outside can be taken as coincidences and yet from a, a, a personal standpoint have a very deep meaning for mm -hmm. the person who lived the, 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 this event. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For instance, you quote two uh, nice, uh, uh, amazing coincidences, apparent coincidences between the prediction of uh, somebody who was uh, who lost the, the eye and another person who who had predicted his death uh, five mm -hmm. years after. So this is extremely meaningful as individual events, mm -hmm. and yet it's quite difficult to, to put all these events together to, to make it into an objective, massive event. And therefore, that there might be a sort of di discrepancy between the methods that are used by parapsychologists that <coughs> try to mimic science and, uh, and uh, the, the fact that are much more subtler and, and more individual and, and probably more significant for that reason. So, this mm -hmm. is, uh, uh, yeah, so I'm my final uh, comment would, would be, why be so, uh, so uh, uh, in fact, um, common 
as to as to value science as the ultimate value of life. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. right. uh, and this is a kind of argument that has also been made within the parapsychology community. And if you think historically in the tradition, uh, experimental parapsychology, the more obsessive, if you will, let's do things as other scientists do them, has been traced mostly, even to a bit incorrectly, to Joseph Banks Rhine in the US. But his wife, Luisa Rhine, was collecting anecdotes, meaningful anecdotes. Most of them have to do with deaths and accidents. So I, my particular view is that we should try to investigate from different perspectives and different methods. I would not want, because if we were to completely stop doing experiments, I think we can say, okay, we will become just com only a socio-cultural event. Let, forget about any scientists caring about us. I think if we continue to do both, we will be in a better shape. And there are people who, I did not quote, but who have been doing that work, especially, for example, therapist Elizabeth Lloyd Meyer wrote a book called Extraordinary Knowing. She was an eminent psychoanalyst. And she became convinced, <laughs> I'm keeping track, uh, she became convinced that there was something to it when her daughter got a very unusual harp stolen in, uh, this was in Berkeley. And she could not find it any other way, and then uh, her daughter was very sad, so a friend tells her, why don't you call a dowser who lives in another state, very far away, had never been in California. So this is really crazy. I consult the dowser, the dowser tells me, I know where the harp is, it is in this street in Oakland, not even in Berkeley, in Oakland. They are two adjacent but very large cities. So she contacts the police, the police says, well, we cannot <laughs> go into the house because <laughs> a psychic said so. But what she did was to put on little posters in a radius of two blocks. And within a day or so, she gets a call of the person who has found the harp. So there are people who have been writing, I would say, reasonable, intelligent books, because I think there are also a lot of very ill thought and very ill reason books there that don't help us at all. Uh, but there are also a number of these books there. So I think it happens, and it should happen from a bunch of areas. But you're absolutely right that in a sense, not only in perhaps psychology, but also in psychology, we're going to deal with emotions, life. Most of the studies that we do in psychology are <laughs> pithy, little trivial, trivializations of what actually happens. That's it. He was next. Yes. This morning I had a coffee with two friends from California and uh, one of my dear friends said that she had read in the Guardian newspaper that our Prime Minister had said that we, that Britain, is a Christian country. Hmm. And my friend said, what's, what's going on with the Prime Minister? And I said, well, he's still living in the 15th century. <laughs> and, but the point that I wanted to ask uh, with you here is that quite often with altered states of consciousness, quite often is associated with the religious, spiritual, mystical experience uh, there. Primarily, so far, we have touched upon a language which is primarily scientific and psychological, we could, we could say. Is there, uh, in your view, um, a value and a use of this for people's religious, mystical, spiritual experiences and using the language of their, if they have, religious faith. And is there a place for um, G-O-D? Is there a place for, sorry, what? G-O-D. God. God. God, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was G-O-L-F. <laughs> <No, no, no. laughs> <laughs> No, no, I, I think, yes, I, I think it, it depends so much on how one would define God or G-O-D-E-S-S -S also. <laughs> yeah, uh, my definition is not at all a personal God. Uh, I don't think it's, what comes closest would be that unfathomable absolute that is somehow providing meaning to all there is, providing some kind of meaning that we're not even remotely close to understanding. So that is, as <laughs> that is my version. 
so for me, that is, insofar at the very least, in, as I said, most of what we're talking about here is about things we do not know. Do we have time for Ravi or not? It's 30 seconds. I'm just going to make a very small comment, really, because it's very much related with the last comment. I was also going to raise that mystical experiences are very suspect in any institutionalized church. And I'm sure the parapsychological experiences in the general mind are somewhat in that direction. So mm -hmm. that area actually needs to be investigated. My impression is that for these kinds of research to be ex acceptable, it, it, much of the obstruction actually comes from the religious institutions. They may not quite so say so, mm -hmm. but I think what this gentleman was saying is uh. worth considering. Yeah. Well, at least for the very fundamentalist, David Luke mentioned something about why the Stargate project was ended. We are out of time. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you.